Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. This is Dr. Vajiha Javed, and I will be your moderator for the afternoon today. Welcome to our series in Public Health Line. Today's episode is episode three, and uh, we'll be talking about how pharmaceuticals faced uh, during the whole health crisis. Uh, we'll be taking a global overview uh, about how pharmaceuticals uh, were during uh, the pandemic situation, how sales at Sectra were during different quarters, how the global market reacted. Today with me, we have two panelists from uh, Southeast Asia. I have with me Mr. Khalid Mehmood, who is the Managing Director and CEO of Gets Pharma. Uh, Khalid is a 35-year veteran in the healthcare and pharmaceutical industry and has worked over for 14 years in different uh, uh, positions in the pharmaceutical and primary healthcare industry in the US, Far East, and Asia Pacific. Uh, I also have with me Ms. Kasturi Wilson, who is the group CEO of Hamas Holdings. Ms. Kasturi is the group CEO of Hamas Holdings P, uh, PLC. She is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants as an, and is an alumni of the Senior Executive Leadership Program at Harvard Business School. She currently serves on the board of Capital Alliance Limited as a non-executive uh, director and is currently the first female president of the Sri Lanka Chamber of Pharmaceutical Industry. So welcome, uh, Mr. Khalid and Ms. Kasturi, to the program today. So as we all know, COVID-19 has left us wondering where we all went wrong. A lot of things changed. We faced a lot of challenges. Our perspectives generally to life have changed. Uh, we have incurred a lot of economic losses globally. Just in the health industry and just looking into the US economic market, we saw a decline in real GDP of around 33% just in the US in two quarters. That's massive. Similarly, if I just look into pharmaceuticals, the top 15 uh, pharmaceutical companies in the world, within a six month time period from the start of COVID till now, have incurred around a loss of 4.9 billion US dollars. That is immense. Uh, so while we do the question answer session for today, while a lot of reports have been published in the US and the EU markets uh, for pharmaceuticals, very less literature and talk is available around the Southeast Asia and the South Asia market. So I would like you two to answer the questions that uh, we have in our minds, that our audience has in mind, and um, we can start forward. So my first question for today is going to be, that quarter one globally saw a very in different trend that there was um, an increase in pharmaceutical sales that was seen worldwide. Now, the reason for that was different for different countries, but majorly it was around stockpiling and it was around panic buying, majorly for uh, chronic diseases like cardiovascular diseases, for general medicines, and also for medicines that were used in COVID-19. So given this background context, what do you think were the various short-term uh, effects of COVID-19 in the pharmaceutical market, both in Southeast Asia and in South Asia? While you answer, can you please focus on both the, uh, the demand as well as the supply side? Can you also talk a little about the regulatory policy shifts that happened during that? And also if there was a shift in communication uh, whether you know what there was a shift in uh, telemedicine, whether you, uh, you saw a decrease in face to face um, <clears throat> interaction between the doctor and the patient, and how that overall impacted the Southeast Asia and the South Asia pharmaceutical market. So, whoever wants to go in first, whether it's Khalid or uh, Ms. Kasturi. Okay, so I'll just uh, very briefly. Um, take the first question about the shift in uh, pa patterns of consumption. So because uh, uh, Gets Pharma is present both in South Asia and Southeast Asia from Philippines to Myanmar to Cambodia and uh, and of course in uh, <coughs> Pakistan, Sri Lanka. Um, so, you know, when, when uh, as we know that 
COVID came uh, in different uh, countries or regions at different times. Uh, I think we all know that the first uh, it uh, it appeared in um, China, or it was uh, it, uh, there was a uh, quite a bit of uh, crisis there, and it was very severe. The mortality was high, and as the news started coming out, and in the beginning, people did not even know whether it is it, it is localized or it is a pandemic. So once it was established that it is a pandemic, this is when <clears throat> fear spread, and it is but natural that people started hoarding uh, medicines. Everyone from consumer to retailer to distributors started um, uh, stockpiling or uh, who, or at least in increasing the inventory to be more uh, accurate in business terms. And uh, uh, this uh, is also because, uh, you know, there are two major uh, suppliers of APIs uh, in the world with China and India. And when China gets hit or India gets gets hit by any 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 such na uh, you know pandemic, obviously there are uh, bound to be uh, disruptions in supply. So therefore, quarter one uh, of 2020 uh, witnessed a surge in in sales and inventories uh, throughout South Asia and Southeast Asia. And I think I suspect that this is. How it how it um, would be in the in many other countries, uh, which uh, which got uh, pre prepared for it, which were preparing for it, and expected uh, the pandemic to hit the, in their country too. Uh, so quarter two then, uh, because of the stock, uh, because of the increase in uh, inventories and at every level, quarter two of course saw a very 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 steep decline in uh, in the movements of um, from uh, manufacturing facilities to to distributors to uh, to retailers uh, and in quarter three which we have about to uh, we've just passed uh, we we saw again uh, uh, supplies and sales catching up um, uh, and they're back almost to uh, 20 or 20 percent, uh, but 20 percent of uh, decline in quarter two from quarter one was very, very steep and very significant. It's not back back to the same level yet, uh, because in some markets it's it's uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, the, the, there's health insurance and uh, um, and uh, but uh, in, in countries uh, where there are out of pocket expenses and there are several in South Asia and Southeast Asia where people have to pay for it uh, from their own pocket. Um, you know, the uh, with, with the unemployment and reduction in uh, businesses, businesses closing down, small businesses closing down, restaurants closing down, etc. Uh, or, or, or closed down. Uh, obviously, it uh, people, uh, a very large part of the population became unaffordable. And hence, it has uh, hit the uh, supply chain, uh, sub, uh, supply curve. Uh, well, sorry, demand curve. And I believe, uh, I suspect that it's going to be there for a while till we completely recover from this pandemic and this business as usual, which I think is is a distant dream. And I hope it is that, but it's uh, uh, there's there isn't anything in sight yet. So I think very nicely summed up uh, Khalid Saab. So the global market kind of saw a similar trend. There was a, a massive increase in quarter one, led to a sharp decline in quarter two. And that kind of uh, was across various uh, disease categories and for various medicines, et cetera, even for chronic uh, diseases. So Ms. Kasturi, my question here for you is just um, build up on the questions that I had for Khalid. That do you think that across different categories of medicines, across cardiovascular, across diabetes, uh, oncology, et cetera, did you in Sri Lanka see a shift in any category within the three quarters? Did you feel that chronic uh, uh, medicine diseases were, uh, were stayed at a plateau or did you see a sharp incline um, even 
during COVID-19 for those? Or was it the opposite way around? The US market actually saw an increase in quarter two for cardiovascular diseases and for chronic disease medication. Whereas for all other forms of medication, it went down sharply. Uh, yeah, hi, uh, Dr. Majida Vadiha. Yes, um, so I think, um, like Khalid said, uh, most of the countries in this region kind of have a similar pattern. Um, mm -hmm. And while we faced supply shocks in some instances staying from the APIs, and I think secondary supply constraint was when the production facility had to operate, I think, uh, under physical distancing norms and safety standards. Um, however, on the consumption side, um, we also um, had a huge, uh, first it was panic buying, but when you underlie, you kind of deep dive into that, it was predominantly in the NCD spaces, right, on the chronic spaces. So, in mm -hmm. fact, uh, what the thing we realized is that we as a, in the region itself, um, mainly because it's of our lifestyle, we've got a very unhealthy lifestyle and uh, majority over 70 percent of the population has either cardiovascular problem or diabetes and uh, and the, in sri lanka particularly diabetes has a growth rate of over 20 percent per annum of new incidents so uh, in this context um, we did see a steep uh, increase in demand during the first quarter um, mm -hmm. And we and Sri Lanka. Just to give context to the uh, other viewers, we have a mixed market where we have private sector retailers, and um, you have a state sector which also supply. Uh, you know, you on a clinic day, you give your medicine free of charge for the people who can't afford. However, both sectors felt, felt this increase in these uh, uh, categories. The second quarter, again, even though there was not the same growth rate we saw in the first quarter, that predominantly these categories showed growth. However, we felt we saw the degrowth in the categories of antibiotics and um, some of the vitamins and stuff purely because I guess um, people, you know, you know, by adapting a more healthier method of operating by washing your hands and wearing masks might be and the fact that I think most regions had schools closed or working having online schooling the, the fact that infections which were general viral or nature or bacterial didn't seem to be uh, in the same form as we saw before uh, so we found those categories directly seeing a de decline and from an overall market perspective, I guess it still saw, Q2 saw a decline right across the regions. Uh, Sri Lanka particularly had a slighter growth of about 2%, but the region, I mm -hmm. think it's a, it's a decline. Uh, from a uh, regulatory standpoint, I guess uh, um, we see most regulatory uh, people, officers are struggling to cope up with um, getting this kind of the, what they do is registrations, renewals, access to approval. The speed of which it happens has to change and the method of which it happens has to change. So adapting technology in those kind of environments is kind of slow, which now we see as bottlenecks from either from a sourcing market or from a supply point of view. So I guess in Q3, what's interesting to see is this guy is the global effect due to these bottlenecks. Because while the, the funnel of inventory seems to be moving out um, from either regu registrations or renewals or, or even dossiers perspective, are we going to face shortages due to these bottlenecks? I, I feel there would be a struggle of getting things streamlined to the regulatory side um, from any government or any country's perspective. And we here in Sri Lanka are seeing that. Um, so that also might have, so Q3 would be interesting to understand because uh, like Kali Pidilud, every country is seeing a different state or a, of, of the disease or whether it's a, a recovery point of view or it's a second wave or a third wave. So it's not that, that every oper country is operating at a different level. So. Mm -hmm. I guess um, Q3 in some ways would be more challenging than Q1 and Q2, 
because either China would be up and um, and then the regional countries might be struggling. So when you talk, you talk about Vietnam, Sri Lanka, all of us are going through certain second waves. So um, would be challenging. I guess, yes, time is going to tell that, but pharmaceutical market overall has been pretty resilient. It kind of bounced back globally, as we are seeing, but yet time will tell. So there have been quite a few short-term impacts on the pharmaceutical market, one of which we have discussed, which was basically an increase and then a sharp decline and the market bouncing back. Another one was supply chain issues and shortages, majorly, majorly in the raw material initially because they were all coming from either China or India. Uh, Khalid, would you like to highlight that particular point, how your country particularly faced, if they faced any drug shortages um, in the supply chain and in OTC products, specifically in quarter one? And you okay, can talk so, in terms of both COVID as well as non-COVID medicines. All right. So, so you say uh, when... Uh, COVID hit, uh, took, uh, you know, hit China like a storm, uh, or at least uh, this is what we saw from a distance. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, we, uh, the world is dependent on APIs from China and India. So for us, it was, uh, and everybody else, for all the manufacturers in the world, uh, a panic spread that uh, that uh, they did not know whether a the APIs uh, would be the supply of APIs would be disrupted for um, a month or two months or three months or six months or 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 more and uh, but unfortunately there was very little that you could do uh, mm -hmm. because uh, the COVID was there. And indeed, uh, factories uh, first in Ch China and later on in India were closed down. Um, but uh, I must say this, that uh, both China and India were very organized and very resilient. And uh, they, the disruption did not last long. However, mm -hmm. there were other disruptions. Um, I think there were shortages, uh, inevitable, and uh, uh, inevitably there were shortages of some medicines. Not everybody can afford to uh, carry huge inventories, and yeah. and uh, there are due to peaks in demand and supply and demand, the inventories do uh, vary. So some companies did not get a chance to really uh, order and receive or or. They were on order and did not receive. There, are, there is a three to four months lead time sometimes on some uh, APIs. Therefore, there was a disruption of that kind. However, there are other disruptions, uh, namely that for a while, um, once the slowly and steadily uh, China started supplying, shipping uh, uh, APIs, the ports were not uh, open. The ports were delayed. Uh, uh, there was a long delay and then uh, um, uh, as a result, in some cases, uh, companies had to airlift uh, and get it by air freight. The cost, uh, of course, went up uh, very high. There was a significant increase in the cost of shipping from the from the by air, mm -hmm. and of course, and of course, uh, the airlines and the sea freighters themselves increased the prices, uh, especially the airlines. Uh, there, there was a reduction in cargo planes. There were very few uh, cargo uh, flights uh, coming in, in some markets and uh, some airports. And those that did, obviously, their costs went up. So, uh, uh, so they increased the prices too. So, this was this was now as a as a result of uh, uh, COVID, uh, uh, the prices of uh, APIs have gone up of most products. And and you know the the there is uh, this is this is another impact, and and of course uh, with spikes coming uh, appearing um, uh, in everywhere, I think uh, there, there, that's also a downside, and there's going to be disruption. So there's a lot of uh, there was already in in every business there is uh, some amount of. Uh, Uncertainty now, of course, there is ambiguity. 
piled on uncertainty as a result of uh, uh, COVID. So there's more, uh, more risk and more, uh, I guess, fun to do business. That's an interesting point of view. Uh, Ms. Kasturi, would you like to add something? Um, yeah, I guess uh, while there's more risk and the fun part is that uh, the healthcare industry is one of the more resilient businesses, I could say. Um, and uh, while, yes, the truth remains that all supply chain costs went up, including logistic costs, but the beauty of it is uh, humanity trumped commercial at that point, I think right across everybody in the supply and the, the supply or the importer they actually made sure the prices kind of was not the foremost thing the supplies was important but as i said before now i mean the impact of that has to be how much of uh, cost could somebody take in this whole disruption but that's where as Khalid said the fun begins but uh, it's going to be challenging times because uh, with the different uh, spikes happening at different times in different locations uh, and the, the, the markets like US, Europe also having their, their impact as well. This is a global impact, not like one or two countries. So when production, even though it is not totally disrupted, there would be a percentage of a reduction in output because of certain uh, all factories not being open, maybe 80% being open. That impact means that countries would be having to fight for their share in the value chain. So smaller countries in the region, whether it's uh, uh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, vis-a-vis um, -vis the giants like India, um, would be having to have their supply chains robust, be risk with have multiple sourcing points to make sure that um, the, the supply chain and the patients uh, really needs are, are looked after but um, all this because it's not an industry specific like i think Khalid said in the first question it has impacted most industries smes are closing down it has made the people redundant in terms of job global travel has um, been um, kind of curtailed so this has an economic impact to every government uh, any government which has deep pockets can give fiscal stimulus to keep companies or uh, industries going. Uh, the the more middle income countries uh, struggle with it. So mm -hmm. the repercussion of that is that you would have that having a pressure on inflation and and uh, the exchange and stuff like that, which would it would mean that any um, country which is under price control has to make sure that. Uh, these kind of variables are also looked at in terms of um, sustainability of the supplies because the, uh, these are out of control. So this is why the countries will have a trip, ripple effect on this whole thing. Uh, how does the economy in total come? Because there are some uh, industries which are more resilient, but they would necessarily not be the trust industry for that country in that uh, uh, maybe for that country. Uh, say if you take Vietnam and uh, say Sri Lanka, you had a parallel and Bangladesh, a parallel being a trust industry. And that's going to be kind of um, impacted for the in the short term. And uh, how do you compensate? I mean, it, it's really tough. So this has a ripple effect in our fiscal uh, policy as well as our exchange and uh, how that affects to consumer affordability. So the next quarter would have, I think, is the, going to be the, the toughest quarter for us as uh, as an indu as the industry. I, I kind of echo your views, which uh, I, though I would love to talk more about shortages, etc., but I, because time is short, I want to move on to another area that analysts have taken out to be the one that has been affected in the pharmaceutical sector on the whole. If you talk about the big giants in the US and EU, there's been a lot of talk that a lot of R&D money, research and development money for pharmaceuticals has shifted into COVID-19, um, uh, new technology, etc. Though the case might not be true for Southeast Asia and South Asia, yet has there been any impact in your business lines for any new product launches that were supposed to happen in the early time phase of 2020? 
or has the generic market uh, gone un uh, has gone unaffected by this? It's again an open-ended question for both of you, whoever wants to go first. So from the markets, I see um, product launches, we operate in Myanmar and Sri Lanka, and uh, I think they've taken a back seat. Mm -hmm. uh, most, in, there are a few reasons, one being is it the most relevant thing at this point, uh, because product launches and then the, the, the prescription of it comes with the the fact that patients are do do go and see doctors, we see a shift. We saw a huge shift of the OPD uh, patient footfall, and we did see certain trends of uh, e telemedicine and stuff, which was not kind of a full adoption. Um, the effectiveness, but we see having we didn't see that in the first quarter, but second quarter towards the end, we did see certain launches coming through, and these are coming on mm -hmm. a digital format alternate formats, which I think are very interesting formats to keep in the long term. But the other issue we face is, face is the regulatory. Uh, because with mm. this whole, um, uh, with COVID, there were this whole bunch of new drugs which are needed for COVID or potentially can uh, manage COVID. So the, the, the desks were full of those kind of dossiers. And these other generic dossiers were kept in a back burner because they were not seen as critical in this point and which was valid, I guess. So yeah, for while the launches could have been were pushed back, I guess now slowly they are being put but brought out in a different format, which is um, more interesting to see. Hmm. I think uh, the Pakistan case is quite similar to this. And uh, Khalsa, if you would want to highlight if there was a shift in your drug launches also because of any regulatory issues. Yeah, so uh, first I would like to point out that uh, uh, in terms of the innovators, uh, the research and uh, development uh, uh, will, is in my opinion, unlikely to impact uh, because the research and development uh, of a new chemical entity uh, spans over several years, um, if uh, sometimes decades. Uh, so I think that uh, the pharmaceutical companies, um, they may have found some, some slowdown. So the R&D centers, the innovators may have found uh, some slowdown, but I think uh, overall it may not impact. Uh, yes, there are some people do say some that uh, some uh, resources, financial resources were uh, reallocated uh, to finding vaccines and perhaps new treatments for for um, for the uh, for covid and uh, but these are by and large uh, relatively small companies with with uh, large resources and those who did uh, invest large amounts they may have found uh, and if if they uh, if they are able to market they are likely to recover faster than any other in any other uh, therapy uh, in in generics, I think it's the similar kind of uh, experience that uh, Kasturi sh shared. That uh, the of course the the regulatory system uh, and uh, um, to some extent the some parts of the government uh, slowed down considerably the process of uh, the healthcare officials, uh, the regulatory regulatory officials' um, efforts and times. Um, resources were diverted to to the response and prevention of uh, mortality as a yeah. result of COVID, and therefore the 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 regulatory pro process. Uh, um, I think, uh, with due respect to everybody, which was already not uh, too optimum, <laughs> slowed down even further. So we we saw that a number of uh, products that were uh, to be registered did not get registered. And uh, and the slowly coming online, we hope uh, uh, they will recover. And so there were there were some therapies that had to be launched or could not be launched, could not be marketed. But I think uh, it's now uh, getting back to normal. So thank you, Khalid, for that. There's another interesting theory that has been evolving that from globalization we need to shift to localization if the pandemic has taught us anything or not. Now, I'm not sure if um, 
both of you would echo with the same view or not. Uh, but at least, uh, Harid, I would like to ask you that question. That do you think that after supplies were initially cut off for a very short period of time, raw material from China and India, it made come uh, a lot of uh, countries shift to think about a belief that they could maybe start their own production for raw material and for new chemical entities. Now, given the background, because you've been working a lot in Southeast Asia and South Asia, do you think that's something that's only theoretical or would you ever see that coming to practice? Okay, yeah, this is an important question and there's one that has been talked about in many countries. Uh, certainly, certainly the countries in South Asia and Southeast Asia where uh, in which I work. And uh, th this is um, my, my thoughts and opinions. Uh, based on my experience uh, of APIs, uh, is the following. Uh, mm. <clears throat> see, uh, API uh, uh, governments and people uh, expect products, the prices of products to be, um, uh, especially generics, not to be very high. Uh, there is a great uh, lobby, uh, public lobby, sometimes uh, there are vested interests uh, who lobby and uh, to bring the prices down. Sometimes there is a, obviously there's a need uh, of uh, medicines um, to, be, to have optimized uh, kind of uh, uh, pricing so that they're affordable. Uh, mm -hmm. So one of the very big element in, in the affordability of uh, costing or of, uh, in the costing of a drug is is the cost of api of course there is then conversion cost because it is uh, the conversion is done the production is done in one of the most uh, uh, labor intensive one of the most energy intensive one of the most control intensive one of the most quality intensive products of any any product in the world therefore the cost of production is extremely high especially if it is to be complied with to, to according to the ICH guidelines and according to the WHO guidelines. Of course, the other part is, uh, is the API cost. Now, even, even uh, uh, so the API, if you look at how an API is made, uh, API, the logic of pro local production is that the cost will, will, will be lower. Uh, it will cost less to produce locally. But if you look at the API, uh, one has to buy first the, the intermediate. Uh, an API manufacturer has to buy the intermediate. Then there are several steps. There are several, uh, several steps of uh, producing an API. Uh, sometimes there are nine, nine uh, reactions that have to be done. Sometimes there are 15 reactions. Sometimes there are 21 reactions to be done in very sophisticated kind of an equipment using very sophisticated, highly volatile, highly inflammable uh, uh, solvents and other other types of uh, chemicals. And and all this has to be done. Uh, and if you have to import everything from outside your machinery, your uh, flammable, uh, uh, flame-proof kind of uh, equipment, your glass pipeline, your, your specialized pipelines, your uh, chemicals, your uh, specialized solvents, uh, you are dependent a lot on the import of these and the transport of these uh, solvents. Take the example of solvents. The solvents are which are very highly inflammable if you do not produce in your country, you have to import it from other countries in a very, very expensive freight, uh, freight which is uh, inflammable freight and the, sh the, trans the sh shipping companies and the charge uh, uh, several times more than shipping a non-inflammable uh, mm -hmm. solid material, light material. And you know, the, the solvents are both uh, heavy and they are very large in volumes. So you, you, then, of course, they have to be uh, transported in, in specialized, special controlled uh, conditions, sometimes environmentally controlled in conditions. Yeah. So by the time they get to the, to the country and by the time you produce, if you're not able to produce a kilogram of, let's say, an API X at a rate, at, at a cost which is lower or equal to that produce, that is being produced by other countries, then 
I think that uh, you will not be producing, not be able to produce cheaper, uh, cheaper um, uh, product. So while while technology should be developed in any country, in every country, mm. but I think the great expectation that I hear from several sources in many countries that I go and hear and talk to. Uh, where they do not currently produce APIs, the expectation, the great expectation that one day, very soon, they'll be create, developing APIs for the same quality and at a lower price. I think it's not realistic. And over a period of time and given a lot of investment uh, by, and subsidy by the government, uh, that was given in uh, India and China uh, 50 or 60 years ago, uh, or even 70 years ago or 60 years ago or 50 years ago before they became competitive. I, th I think if that kind of resources are available in a country and then that kind of a political will, whether you can, you are willing to change the, um, change the, um, policies and duty structures and, uh, technology and training, you are able to, you are willing to change the syllabus of a, of a, of in the universities that take, teach this, these kinds of, kinds of subjects and, um, and uh, only then will it be viable. Uh, you know, we have uh, a lot of cases in a lot of countries where for the sake of, uh, um, let's say, for a lack of, lack of a better word, uh, self-satisfaction, or status, we set up uh, countries, set up steel mills, and uh, over a period of 10 years, over a period of, sorry, 40 years, uh, they never became viable and they were always subsidized by the governments. Uh, there were there are cases in uh, Malaysia, for instance, where the proton car was uh, subsidized over a period of 20, 25 years. The government mm -hmm. had to sub sub subsidize it to the level of uh, um, uh, my uh, number, uh, if I can recollect correctly, over about a hundred billion dollars. So mm -hmm. those same amount of money that the government is going to give to, to, uh, to, uh, in subsidy, if you can spend in healthcare, if you can s uh, spend in mm -hmm. setting up hospitals, uh, if you can spend in, in setting, uh, se setting, uh, a more robust primary healthcare system which is very weak in some of the countries. Uh, I understand in Sri Lanka it's very strong, but I think uh, Sri Lanka is, it is an exception, uh, at least to the countries where I have been, even to uh, more advanced countries with higher GDP per capita, per capita than Sri Lanka. The primary healthcare system is relatively weak. The government does not spend as much money as it should. And now on top of that, uh, to do something which is, I think, unviable, um, uh, because of uh, some false uh, expectations that if they make the API, they'll have a better healthcare system. I think that's, uh, in my opinion, that's a very flawed and very, uh, um, uh, that'll be a very, very, very unfortunate if uh, governments start uh, doing that. Well, I think that's a very fair point that you make because there are two different kinds of approaches. You can either have a top-down approach or you can have a bottom-up approach. I think if the pandemic has made us realize something, it's that we lost our focus on the primary healthcare system. And if we are to learn something from this is that we should be shifting onto prevention rather than treatment. Uh, I think uh, even in Sri Lanka, uh, they have a very strong healthcare system. Uh, at a primary healthcare level, uh, and they do invest um, a lot in their GDP. But yet, if COVID-19 uh, was to tell governments to do something, it's to invest more in screening and prevention rather than erupting, having the disease erupt, and then focus more on tertiary healthcare. Uh, it brings me to another phenomena here, and the pharmaceutical industry has talked about it a lot, uh, which has also suffered because of COVID-19. And that area is that of medical tourism. Uh, a lot of countries in Southeast Asia were homes for medical tourism. And if either one of you would want to reply to that, uh, Ms. Kasturi, I think we just lost you for a second. But I was just bringing the conversation and steering it towards medical tourism and how that has impacted uh, the global industry uh, in pharmaceuticals 
as a whole. Do you think your country or that of Southeast Asia and South Asia has suffered as a result of that, at least the pharmaceutical market, because of all travel restrictions and all? So, um, so firstly, I think to touch a bit on what Kali said as well. So Sri mm -hmm. Lanka also did uh, jump into the bandwagon about uh, about the, on the subject of localization or self sufficient it mm -hmm. gives a few angles. One is the cost angle, which I I spoke to about what Khalid says. Uh, you cannot. Uh, I mean, it's pharmaceuticals. It's not like a shampoo or a soap. It's a load of years of experience and uh, support from government to build that to that scale. And you need some body for that. Uh, but the second, I think, clear thing is about de-risking on a geo geographical point of view to be able to. Um, have some supplies locally in the, and the, maybe at the base level generate um, without being overly reliant on uh, the global supply chains for everything. Um, in that context, I guess uh, one aspect like the smaller markets like Malaysia, Singapore, Sri Lanka could do is have partnerships with uh, global companies. Because if you look at um, local global manufacturers also, they can't uh, they have to spread their plants at different geographies, whether we like it or not. Uh, geopolitical issues will be facing more when the time goes on. Um, natural disasters are there, and then you have the natural, like the like COVID pandemics coming in. So that's another angle we need to look at: the risking in terms of supply chain, and whether it needs to be risking uh, from a sourcing one central sourcing market to many, and geographically uh, moving the plants is another. Uh, from a medical tourism point of view, I guess there are certain countries like Singapore whose economy actually one of the big revenue drivers for Thailand and Singapore is medical tourism. And from a, from the other markets perspective, we they used to use these countries for better medical for medical services. I guess mm -hmm. it will be a huge impact because whatever I mean, they don't. Uh, build this reputation by not investing. They've invested in the best in class infrastructure, doctors, equipment, and the fact that these borders are closed. And uh, to open the borders, it's not an easy uh, subject because it has to be a bilateral between countries and it has to be at a level. I think Singapore is now trying to open, but with, with countries of the similar standing in terms of recovery, and they would have like a passport of um government to government passport of how they work uh, so it has taken impact it has uh, taken a huge impact in a local context for us what we see is it's not tourism but there is a movement from um, from a state sector into private sector purely because most of the covid patients are being channeled into state sector so when a person who genuinely needs treatment would move into a private sector but given the economic situation i think out of pocket is not a thing that people can easily afford. So I guess there's a pushback on on their treatments and uh, elective treatments will be pushed back. From um, generally from medical tourism, I think that will be one industry which takes a hit like tourism does. Yeah, yeah. And that's what we're seeing on the global front. Actually, there have been massive losses to the pharmaceutical industry uh, within this area. But it uh, brings me again, I'm going to steer the conversation back to regulations because we all seem to love it so much. So if we were to learn anything from COVID-19, at least the drugs that were being used during COVID-19, are there any regulatory changes that you would like to suggest in your particular countries or at a global level? I know Khalita wants to go in first. He was smiling about this question. So do you want to go in first, Khalid? Yes, uh, this this is a I think a very very important question. Uh, the reason is that uh, in a lot of uh, uh, countries in Southeast Asia um, and some in South Asia uh, that I've been to, I've seen uh, two two um, uh, two very, uh, let's say, important uh, oversights and gaps as a result of policy mm -hmm. uh, making uh, policies, uh, incorrect policies of the policy makers. 
Mm-hmm. One is one extreme on the one on one extreme. There is a complete absence or a partial absence in some markets of essential medicines. Mm-hmm. The WHO essential medical med- medicine list. Those those have uh, those products are absent. Those products uh, uh, over the years uh, have been priced out, um, and and uh, there are although there's a huge demand because the population in some countries are very large. Uh, uh, you know, therefore, therefore those uh, there are local manufacturers are not uh, uh, producing it because become they become uh, completely in, unviable. Because there were price controls in them, and then uh, in, uh, in countries where there was no manufacturing, people were not uh, importing those me- medicines because you would rather import a higher price medicine uh, because of the economics involved or financials involved for the com- uh, company. Mm-hmm. So when I've talked to uh, for the past uh, 20 years almost, I've tried to talk to a number of peer regulators in, in a number of countries, including Pakistan, where where we we have uh, this problem. And uh, I think that uh, somehow there's this impression that uh, uh, the essential medicines, uh, they are better medicines than essential medicines. Now, mm-hmm. that is uh, a very unfortunate uh, and incorrect in understanding. I'll give you an example. You take the example of pand- uh, of uh, COVID, which mm-hmm. four medicines were mostly prescribed to treat to treat uh, COVID. First was paracetamol. Yeah. And there is today an international shortage of paracetamol. Mm-hmm. And paracetamol was discovered and was in the market about seventy years ago. Second yeah. was azithromycin. Um, uh, uh, you know, we we do not manufacture in uh, guess what, uh, paracetamol, but we uh, manufacture zitro, azithromycin, and and this product was is about a thirty year old product. So it's a relatively new product, but nevertheless, it's a it's a thirty year old product. The third product, which is which was mostly used. Uh, when when the uh, when the patient got to a to a let's say moderately severe stage in COVID illness was dexamethasone. Dexamethasone also is a seventy year old product. Uh, then of course there was HCQ, which which was uh, um, which was uh, which which some some people some doctors are to this day are using some prophylactically some. Um, uh, some in in patients. Uh, this product is is if you look at the medical li- literature, this product is about about three hundred years old. Of course, it was it is today. It has been refined. It has fewer impurities. It has it is more standardized than it was um, three hundred years ago or a hundred years ago. But mm-hmm. but nevertheless, it's an old product. So so this underscores the the importance of essential drug, uh, pro- drugs and the importance in the eyes of the regulators that please do not neglect neglect uh, essential drugs there are hundreds of companies in every country who are who uh, the, the best model i think is in india and bangladesh where there are companies only producing um, essential drugs and the government has a contract uh, with those uh, companies and uh, for almost 10 years where they have a fixed rate contract whether uh, you know which in, of course is adjusted according to the currency devaluation uh, and of course a little bit of inflation and 24 7 these companies are producing those drugs i think sri lanka also had such an arrange, arrangement and uh, and many other uh, bangladesh has the same thing as a result of which essential drugs are available and and in these countries where essential drugs are available the infant mortality rate, the maternal mortality rate is much lower than in countries where they're not, there's no essential medicines. So unfortunately, this is something which is, which is grossly neglected. And I think it's, uh, I hope that we have, uh, our regulators, our policy makers learn a lesson that this must not be, essential drugs must not be neglected. 
Of course, uh, now we will, uh, some people say, well, we have these wonder drugs. I'm not going to name any, but not wonder drugs, which even the, the president of the United States uh, uh, mentioned and got them passed and under uh, emergency use authorization. Once they pass the EUA, uh, emergency use authorization over the over the months when they are being studied, there are questions coming out in them. They are not they are not as uh, let's say effective. Um, you know, some of them yes were very expensive, uh, anywhere from three hundred dollars to one thousand dollars a while, uh, and as a result of which some more effective old medicines even uh, were were kind of phased out. Uh, and uh, but but I think if you look at the cost of health management and even its efficacy, even if the mortality reduction and mortality rate, we the countries would have been better had they paid more emphasis on the on the on, on these drugs rather than these uh, um, medicines that were passed through e, uh, emergency use authorizations. So this this is this I believe is something which uh, which the policymakers and regulators you have a second par part of the question. I think I've spoken for long. I'll just wait for uh, about what are the some of the other lessons that we have learned. So this was just, this was just related to the policy and the regulate uh, regulatory aspects of uh, the fallout of uh, uh, COVID. Yeah. So like you very rightly talked about inclusion of essential drug medicines and looking into revision of prices so that they are available within the country. Uh, Kasori, would you like to talk about a few policy um, changes that you would like to suggest that you think uh, was uh, a bottleneck within COVID-19 for your particular country or region? So um, Sri Lanka always had a very progressive health policy till uh, we kind of um, brought in um, price control for essentials, which was, I think, in hindsight, we did benefit. So from mm -hmm. a WHO standpoint, um, they talk about um, a patient having high quality uh, drugs, uh, which are affordable and accessible, right? So mm -hmm. I think the policy makers should uh, look at, uh, again, from a, from a regulatory point of view, to mm -hmm. look at the way they can make it accessible, because there is an inflection point where mm -hmm. accessibility will be in, uh, will be questioned in terms of when it doesn't make commercial sense to even supply that. Uh, the other aspect is um, while essentials are locally also supplied in abundance, how do we make sure that we have access to new innovations coming in as well? Uh, because treatments, especially if you talk about uh, cancer, which I think in the entire region and in the world, it's having one of the faster growth rates. We would be to be important that you get access to the latest uh, types of innovation coming in there. So from a regulatory standpoint, I guess um, one thing they have to understand, regulate it where it's needed, but please, what they need to do is make sure they're progressive and efficient in understanding what needs the country needs and make sure that it's not in a way that detrimental, that the patients don't have access to what's needed for them. Um, so I guess that's the only place I'll come from. Other than um, they had a, we have a nice mixed policy here is where we have a base level buyback for generic essentials where people who can't afford can have access to it. Uh, the other the issue is we are a small nation and like us, there are others in, uh, in South Asia, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, which don't have the, the sheer volume to even generate that kind of um, interest in cre creating industry, uh, which, which is innovative and which can drive growth. But uh, we would rely on on global giant big companies who would who have grown over the last seventy to eighty years and who, who find Sri Lanka interesting. So it's a it's from a regulator. While we all consciously want better patient outcomes in terms of health uh, and affordability, that accessibility part is something I'm concerned about. I, I think regulators should look at because mm -hmm. at one point that gets knocked off if you overemphasize on price. So thank you, Ms. Kasturi, which uh, you just finished uh, your point at access and this is where I'm going to pick it up from. 
we're getting quite a few questions uh, on the screen also. And while we have our own, I have my own questions, I would like to take some from the audience as well. So uh, quite a few questions are coming on the affordability element, price reductions, and accessibility of medicines, especially given the time that there's a lot of unemployment. Do you think the government here has a role to play or the pharmaceutical sector does? Because I think we're already quite, um, you know what, uh, price below for uh, a lot of drugs, especially when it comes to a generic market. Uh, Khalid, would you like to share your opinion, especially in regards to Pakistan and a few other Southeast Asia countries? Okay, so I think that uh, both the government and the, and the uh, pharmaceutical sector has a role to play. Uh, what is the role that uh, pharmaceutical sector uh, government uh, can play? Uh, play one mm -hmm. is that um, uh, the the spending on uh, well, first of all, I think since we are talking in uh, perspective uh, with the background of COVID, I hope yeah. that COVID has taught us that health care and health uh, uh, ministry of health, the uh, health spending on health is a very very important aspect. Uh, you know, doctors are also heroes. Doctors are also to be celebrated and they have to be compensated even in government hospitals to a level which is commensurate to their contribution to the society, saving lives in a country. And I think that is in, in developing countries, unfortunately, um, I think if you look at the compensation packages, uh, it's very, very uh, negatively uh, skewed against the compensation of doctors. A doctor goes through five years or seven or ten years of education. He or she spends uh, long hours in, um, in uh, what they call in this part of the world house jobs. And when they come out of t after ten years or nine years of that, they, the, their salaries, I think, uh, uh, at least in government hospitals and even in uh, sometimes private are, 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 are they're underpaid. So uh, they, they, we have seen in pandemic that they, they, have, they have saved lives. Of course, they, when God forbid there is a natural disaster or a war, um, mm. they also save lives. But now pandemics, I, uh, I hope not and may God have mercy. But I think they are likely to be around for a while or to reemerge. So. So the, the governments must realize that they have that they have they have to spend uh, a higher percentage of GDP on health. Uh, the WHO has uh, um, benchmarked about six percent of GDP on health. There are some countries like Algeria, Malaysia, uh, Jordan. They spend as from anywhere from seven percent to eleven percent. There's some countries in South Asia and time. Southeast Asia which spend two uh, percent, you know, uh, yeah. or or two point seven percent. I think it is not going to help any. About I see some questions here. Uh, some uh, uh, some people are saying, will pharmaceutical companies reduce the prices? So uh, it's a very simple calculation. Uh, I mean. Pharmaceutical product is is uh, is manufactured after importing raw material API or making API uh, in, in case in countries where they are made. Then, of course, there's a process. And if you ever uh, visit a, 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 a company which is uh, producing a pharmaceutical product, especially one which is which is uh, which complies with inter complies with international standards. And I hope every company in the world uh, will will comply and does uh, will comply with international standards. The, the, it is a very capital intensive, a very energy intensive uh, process. Uh, you know, the people who work in a pharmaceutical companies are pharmacists, chemists, uh, doctors, uh, scientists, etc. So they have to be paid also, just like do doctors and uh, other professions are paid. So if you reduce, reduce the price of a product, how much, do a simple calculation, how much of a pharmaceutical product contributes when a patient is admitted in a hospital? International studies, local studies, studies by World Bank, studies by, by McKinsey, studies by government agencies tell you that the, the drug contributes no more than 15% of the total cost of 
of the treatment okay. in a hospital or, or yeah. a procedure or surgery. Yeah. Okay, now you talk of, 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 of chronic treatments. If you reduce the price by half, let's say, if if the company ever survives and it does not does not shut down like thousands of other factories have shut down in several countries uh, as a result of uh, be, uh, them become unviable then what is what is how many how many extra people will you save i think the question the answer lies not in reducing pharmaceutical prices prices of pharmaceuticals but spending more on primary healthcare rather than tertiary healthcare, Re, you know, reduce the dependence on medicines by improving and preventing diseases. One today, one in three people in Pakistan, a country like Pakistan and, and, and similar, I think, demographics in the rest of the world also are, are diabetic. By 2050, one, uh, sorry, one in five, today the one in five uh, are, are diabetic. Okay, by 2050, there'll be one in three that'll be diabetic in some parts of the world. If we continue our consumption patterns and we do not bring about awareness, we spend nothing on awareness, we do not uh, reduce the intake of those substances, those uh, types of foods and, uh, and liquids which are harmful for human health in terms of uh, making them hypertensive, diabetic. I think that the dependency on, on medicines will become more and it is the government's responsibility. It is the regulator's responsibility to bring this. Of course, it is the responsibility of each individual, you know, to inculcate this, uh, bring this awareness in their in their in their um, families and their colleagues. Uh, you know, in my my co co company, you know, we provide free, uh, sub highly subsidized medicine. Um, I mean, uh, uh, food in our in our uh, in our company to almost about two thousand people, and they used to drink sodas. And mm. a lot of students. And we showed videos. We showed. Uh, we brought about. We invited doctors. Uh, sometimes doctors also drink sodas. But those doctors who, <laughs> who, who know that drinking so the sodas is injurious, uh, harmful to health, we brought them. We had awareness session today. We have eliminated so the the intake of sodas within our. We 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 have uh, brought about. We have done sessions of against uh, smoking. And and uh, we have our the prevalence of smoking amongst our employees has gone down. So I think that these kinds of things have to be done on a national level, and many countries have done that. And they have, they have I mean this program that I see in in the UAE is remarkable. You know the the impact on the, the they have actually and understand. Uh, a very very robust program, very uh, in which they they do these kinds of activities. They 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 have uh, they've built parks, they build uh, stadiums, they build uh, playgrounds in communities uh, where they where people uh, where the kids uh, uh, do not have a complacent lifestyle and they play sports uh, rather than on on their um, uh, play uh, on their. Um, uh, the the games uh, uh, tele games so I, I think this is something that is more um, far reaching and it's more produce more results than just reducing the prices of medicines because if you reduce the prices of medicines any further you'll close down either the factories a lot of factories uh, less competition more monopoly and also you will reduce the quality of medicines and also you will have fewer businesses coming into it and uh, and you will then have uh, prices that that are incredibly high. I I think I tend to agree with you, especially when it comes to medicines that are part of the essential drug list. Or um, so if you bring down prices, and you all you will be doing at the end of the day is compromising on quality. For instance, they uh, in India once upon a time they used to be. Um, you know what, uh, API factories that were spreading up like mushrooms, but most of them were closed down because their material, uh, the raw material that they were using was not up to the mark. Even in Pakistan, I feel there in are... China. Really, in China. Uh, sorry, in, in China. In China, yeah. In China. So, Ms. Kasturi, would you like to highlight this particular point of view when it comes to uh, your particular country, uh, drug pricing, essential drug lists, and quality? And do you also tend to agree with the fact that prices for pharmaceutical drugs, uh, decreasing prices for pharmaceutical drugs is not the answer here. 
but rather investing in a primary healthcare setting and reducing the disease burden and having the government take ownership. So um, it's a bit of all. I think on pricing itself, I think um, some of the markets which can be not governed, if you can govern, uh, mm -hmm. uh, be, I mean, you have to be, be mindful of affordability, but it has to be that sensible pricing so that yeah. you're not avoiding profiteering. So as long as that's there, I don't believe in, I think even pharmaceutical is a business, but it is a business uh, where you're, you need to get better health outcomes. So just bringing price down, like my previous um, um, statement, if there'll be inflection point, especially if you're an import-driven country, that they would, uh, you just will lose access to it. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's the outcome we want. Um, but in in um, what like talking about what Kali says, I think the bigger, especially in being in healthcare, the biggest thing is how can get, we make sure that there is awareness on on how they to look after their health, right? Especially on this NCD space, what kind of food to eat, how to be healthy a lifestyle. Um, so what we uh, so Hemas is the leading um, healthcare provider in terms of imports and and in the hobby in hospitals and manufacturing as well but in that context uh, what we've done is we also our purpose is to make families happier and one big anchor of that in helpful living is uh, is being healthy so we're trying to partner with government to do our part in bringing this awareness and education part of it so that at rural level they don't they have to understand eating the wrong food and what diabetes is about, right? It's a long journey. Um, whether the proof of whether we've done anything uh, to support it would come maybe in 10 years. We started with uh, looking at ourselves. So all our employees three years ago were screened and 70% of our employees have some indication which is wrong. And mm -hmm. uh, so we are trying to even um, change our lifestyle and be more active in that context. And the, the important thing is that, and I agree that the problem is we need to increase health spending and invest it in the right spaces. Uh, for example, uh, there was a data point uh, Khaled gave, but from a Sri Lankan context, context our, when you look at our per capita or the, the um, household income, approximately 3 to 4% is only spent on drugs. Uh, there is about 25% which, which is spent on, on hospitalization or, or um, drug or lab tests or something out of their household income. Uh, but however, we need to make sure that the state infrastructure is brought up to a level and the, the kind of quality of what we give out from there to the, the, the population is kind of, uh, it is improved. Uh, whether it's here or whether it's any country in the region, leaving countries like uh, Singapore and Thailand, um, Malaysia, which I think that the infrastructures have been developed, I think we all can invest a lot, much more in getting that. Uh, and the, the, per, the GDP allocation towards health has to be sizable enough. And, and the plan is to make sure it's done, invested in the right places. Mm, so I, I, I so. And I'm also on the same page of um, what are we trying to say, reduce price, reduce price. At one point, somebody would say it's not worth it because either you, you don't need half quality is needed to get the outcome. Quality is, if quality is compromised, your outcomes are not given. Get there. So what, you, what are you trying to, what are we trying to do as responsible pharmaceutical companies? We should make sure whatever comes out, we are going to be able to put our hand in our heart and say this is of this quality and the patients will be the desired outcome is there that comes with a cost to it so if anything is below that cost i mean you rather go and do some other business because um, so i mean i rather put as a commercial enterprise we'll rather put that shareholders investment somewhere else and i'll do some other business but while being morally obligated there has to be a sensible equation where that accessibility is ensured no, no, I think you both make very uh, interesting arguments, but we're getting a lot of questions from the audience calling it counterintuitive that a pharmaceutical industry, both of you, are talking about investing in preventive health care. So at the end of the day, wouldn't that 
be driving pharmaceuticals out of business? And so why? Purpose to come in. So we had this little argument when we put the purpose. We said, look, end of the day, when you operate in a country, you're first, uh, you're part of that country. And you're obligated to make sure you are impacted. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it means you're going to lose revenue on certain things, that's so be it. In CDs, let's make sure if you want a productive workforce for our economy to grow, let's make sure we do our part to support this NCD burden coming down. Less sales, that's fine. But there are other ailments, and let's make sure we drive innovation and bring in new uh, products in. I mean, that's fine. Um, do we bring NCDs down to zero? I wish we could, but it does won't. It's just that we curtail the growth which is happening. At the moment, it's growing at around 20%. So wh why should we be in first? We, are the, we all belong to a country and we, are, we all belong to a world. And shouldn't it shouldn't be commercial at any cost. So I, I, I think companies are willing to, I, I know big, uh, including Gets, they invest in educating people about awareness of what uh, diabetes is about. Is about. And more you prevent, yes, there will be less sales in that segment, but that's a call uh, companies will, will take. I mean, so Vajia, when I, I live in the US, yeah, Vajia, when I were, uh, uh, studied and uh, later on uh, lived and worked in the US, uh, this question at one time uh, was a very, very, very hot question. So there were two, <laughs> two extremes you know as they call in politics the left wing and the right wing so the right mm -hmm. wing used to the left wing used to say tell the government uh, policy makers to stop producing weapons of mass destruction the mm -hmm. right wing uh you know the people who like war and the people who um uh have shares in uh, financial interest in the in the military industrial complex they sell less than I mean, if you're going to make stop making weapons of mass destruction, then mm -hmm. then so many people will be unemployed. You know, now now the problem is this: that if you make we 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 weapons of mass destruction, then they use it. You know, you have to use them. You know, and then it's a further, it's a even more healthcare crisis. Not even not even in in the in the in other countries where those weapons are used. But even those countries which are making those weapons excessively, such as in the United States, where almost 5 million people are homeless, 40 million people do not have health insurance or have substandard health insurance. So I think that that this question that if uh, you do prevention, then pharmaceutical companies are going to um, go out of business. So let, hypothetically, if prevention is going to completely uh, make pharmaceutical companies and medicines redundant. That's utopia. This is how it used to be. Uh, I think in some some play, in the me medical lit health literature tells you there was the, some some little town in Japan where people had zero hypertension or diabetes. And cancer was unheard of. And about a hundred years ago, this was how it is in some place in Gilgit, Baltistan, where there was no reported case uh, of. Um, of uh, these chronic disease diseases, you know, maybe somebody fell down from a mountain or something or slept and uh, died. But I think people died mostly of uh, old age and death, uh, old age and natural causes, you know. So I, I think that this is a, a, a very, very important question. But I think that to, to be serious uh, or more serious and more relevant, I don't think any kind of the, the, the misuse of the amount of chemicals, amount of pesticides, the amount of toxins in the environment have gone so far out, uh, you know, so far out, uh, exceeded so much. And the complacency and the, the modern life that diseases will be around. But the, the idea is the objective is to reduce it, uh, to reduce the prevalence um, in, in societies and countries. Uh, you know, where, where, and people who have uh, uh, changed their lifestyle, uh, even today, have seen, in, have seen a, a very, very um, sharp decline in their, in their, uh, um, in their indicators of, uh, you know, HbA1c's or, or uh, cholesterol or, you know, the lipid profiles, etc., uh, and, 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 you know, this is, this is like today, 
so i think i think it's uh, it's uh, its importance is uh, uh, very very uh, real and there are countries who spend a very large amount of money out of their health budget on prevention and awareness uh, uh, and therefore it does uh, produce results in uh, uh, societies and i think this should be uh, this of course the other part is of course having a first class primary healthcare system where your essential program for immunization um outreach is close to 100% where your uh, where your um, the 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 rural health care system is very robust and it's uh, very very um well managed no well, i think it's very heartening coming from both of you and it gives uh, you know what a sense of positivity coming forward had we invested in preventive health care we might not even have had a pandemic we would have you know what caught it early maybe through early surveillance etc uh just makes me come back to one of my last questions that i want to ask both my panelists we saw a decrease in face to face interactions and an increase in uh telemedicine in a lot of global uh, areas that includes you know what the eu markets as well as the us markets what has your um you know what country has your country being in southeast asia shifted more towards telemedicine or is that something that we uh, still in middle and low income income countries is something that we cannot move towards as uh, you know what a regular uh, feature so what i'm trying to ask is that do you think telemedicine could be the next future of the pharmaceutical market yes or no i think it, it it is a it is a future we should move towards because uh, we mm-hmm. thought during covid uh, that is the only way people had access to some kind of um, connection with the doctor uh, however that is still from these kind of regions it's only it's more on the urbanized cities and urbanized com- consumer who does um, mm-hmm. uh we did see that the rural area maybe because of the lack of um, the type of infrastructure on connectivity and the smartphones uh for that penetration as well as remember during covid in this context we are talking about 70% of the population having an nc for them mm-hmm. it is seeing a doctor but being able to uh, go and uh, get their prescription fulfilled for another month um but the rest of them even if they are sick they need to go to their known gp so it has to shift but the urban side of it i we noticed a huge change in how they adapted quickly from a, from groceries to medicine to telemedicine uh, how mm-hmm. they adapted so i guess as a lesson learned how do we take this technology to the to the region or to the west to other side of the nation and how do you address this as a requirement to the relevant communities the some communities might not be comfortable they are all comfortable with their own gps in the way they communicate in their own dialect uh, so that's a thought of how innovation can happen and support but i think that's a trend we should keep and try to solve going forward mhm makes sense uh, harid would you like to add something here from your perspective at kits pharma was there a shift to telemedicine yeah i think i think there was we we have uh, in our company several initiatives of telemedicine they they mushroomed uh, in covid and then they came uh, they are very low but there it is very encouraging to see that some very good telemedicine companies uh, have uh, st- uh, are in operations now they're doing well there is uh, i think it makes a lot of sense especially in um, developing countries where a uh, woman have a uh, difficulty um uh a- and old people have difficulty uh in uh, traveling uh to uh, to the doctors and sometimes lives are saved just uh, if there is a timely uh, help and alarm uh, from the symptoms based on telemedicine and i think that if you look at uh, the telemedicine companies around the world not just in the united states but in pakistan they are doing very well their client age is uh, increasing their funding is increasing their profitability is increasing and i think this is uh, this is likely to grow even even more uh, i think it makes sense 
uh, it's just like uh, we are today talking uh, on uh, on the software and communicating i think perfectly well and even reaching a wider audience than before when just about a year ago or 10 months ago where for this kind of a uh, uh, exchange and discussion we had to travel uh, to one country or, or one city to another and uh, pollute the environment further through air fuel, uh, fuel of the air uh, emissions coming out of the airplane and through generating more carbon uh, monoxide and hydrocarbons uh, by, by going in uh, cars and planes, etc. So I, th I think uh, it makes a, uh, it, it's likely in my opinion, it's going to be the new normal, part of the new mm -hmm. normal. And I think it's a very healthy new normal. So I, I wish the telemedicine companies uh, more uh, success and more sophistication and more documentation and better outreach. Agreed. Uh, so another question that we're getting on the screen, similarly the way, you know what, uh, there's a doctor patient interaction. Uh, during the pandemic, pharmaceuticals were also uh, in contact with doctors through a lot of webinars and web talk shows. Do you think that could also be something that the industry could pick up in the longer run? I think that's an interaction and educational interaction, marketing interactions between uh, pharmaceutical agencies and their customers, that is the doctors. Yeah, so I guess it brings back to why we interact with doctor and what can we value what offer for mm -hmm. the knowledge and the new sciences and exactly. what is in there. So um, the format of this is absolutely apt. It also my my thinking is personally that brings in more governance in terms of ethics and makes it more economical in terms of how you engage in the sense it's uh, digital and and the outcome is look you still are giving them from knowledge, this new knowledge, they're equipping them to how they could use a new kind of uh, uh, drugs or technology in terms of interventions. So that's a useful way of going through and digital in any format. I mean, as long as uh, you'll miss that human interaction, but you can have it with the less, less frequently, but the digital as a format to have interaction is, I think we should adapt. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you because a lot of those resources could then be shifted towards uh, R&D instead of investing in that kind of a sales force. Maybe in the long run, but maybe that's something that we're talking about for over a decade. Uh, though I would love to carry this conversation forward, but uh, I'm going to wrap it up in the next five to 10 minutes. So for both of my esteemed panelists, I would like you to wrap up your personal views, maybe in the form of two suggestions you would like to talk to our audiences about that you felt that there should be changes in your particular country, in your particular, um, you know what, regulatory areas or in practices that you would like to see in a post-COVID world when it comes to uh, the pharmaceutical uh, agency or healthcare generally overall. Uh, there's no wrong, no right, but these are your particular views, things you would like to see changed in the world when it comes to the pharmaceutical sector. Whoever wants to go in first, or maybe we can ask first um, Khalid one thing, and then I'll bounce to Kasturi, then I can come back to Khalid and Kasturi, then we'll wrap it up. So one each first. You're going to go first? OK. So okay. I, I think uh, I think that I, um, I, I think that it's, uh, I hope <laughs> that uh, the world uh, countries, regulators, policy makers, people are not just waiting for the vaccine and hoping that this pandemic will go away and they'll go back to the old world, old norm. Uh, I hope that they realize that uh, pandemics are bound to be around. Uh, people, as I always say, that uh, people of diverse, uh, far, uh, you know, people whose ideologies are poles apart from the Pope to, to environmentalists who tend to be leftists, uh, scholars and academicians, scientists have expressed that the single biggest danger to human, to the world, to mankind is climate change. So who has changed the climate? Of course, the, the man has. 
and some women have also changed their mind. <laughs> so, 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 so I think that uh, uh, therefore, uh, pandemics uh, are going to be around in one form or the other, in one intensity or the other. So I hope that people, our governments, policymakers, uh, um, realize that and prepare for that. And I, in my simple mind, and just two points come to my mind. One is that they must, we must respect the environment, uh, not change it, deforestation. Uh, uh, and of course, the, the, the five biggest things, the five largest contributors to the destruction of the ozone layer and the, car the, the um, uh, generation of the carbon footprint must come to an end. Mm -hmm. uh, sustainable development must be um, incorporated in, in how we live. Um, mm -hmm. uh, There's too large a to topic for me to even give one or two examples. But if, but if anybody has would like to uh, read one Bible on it. It's uh, Jürgen Randers, uh, the spirits of the limits to growth, uh, and his new book. So that's mm -hmm. one. But but the other one is that I hope we realize people and governments realize that the healthcare providers, the entire ecosystem of health care, uh, must be must be respected. They are as important as anybody else. Uh, any other uh, institution to save lives. Um, this uh, we must give special care not only to uh, textile industry, uh, which is uh, producing uh, better and uh, more um, exotic uh, uh, clothes and fashions that change every other week, uh, and the old uh, clothes are discard have to be discarded. <laughs> Uh, which is, I guess, all oh, it has its place, you know. But but also give special attention, concessions, um, care, uh, the same kind of privileges that are given to other industries, uh, also to the to the healthcare industry, whether they are hospitals or pharmaceutical industries, which are providing a very valuable service services, or to pharmaceutical distributors, um, and the entire uh, supply chain. And of course, uh, of course, the people who work in it, the people who are producing medicines, the people who are the workers who are producing medicines, the the, the pharmacists, the chemists, the uh, the doctors, and of course, doctors in hospitals. I think that this pandemic has taught us that they are the most important part of our of our ecosystem. They are the mm -hmm. most important life saviors that we have in the world uh, today. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I think that you respect and uh, uh, privileges, uh, returns, uh, care for them should also be. We have done a great series called our, you know, respect our heroes. We uh, salute our heroes. And I think I think this is this is the two uh, take home lessons that I, I would like to uh, suggest to my colleagues, my and those who are listening to me, whatever it's worth. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Khalid. So he's left us with really two important messages around the environment and investing in healthcare structures. Ms. Kasturi, uh, you're up next, please. Um, so for my two messages, again, one single thing, uh, two things. One of these is environment again. We do be good by the planet we live in. Um, some, if it's damaged, it's too much. And um, if we want, our kids and our, our kids kids to live in this planet we need to do right by them mm -hmm. uh, so that starts from us as individuals and it starts and it goes into the companies as well how we operate and how what kind of materials we use how we discharge uh, from a healthcare perspective um, the pandemic taught us that healthcare industry is important of course the doctors and the caregivers are the really important people but the fact that in an emergency like this, A is people need medicine. So it's an industry which has to operate. People have to take not take things for granted. Safety measurements has to be at a higher standard because uh, if they get impacted, it's going to be a bigger crisis. 
But uh, I guess while we continue to battle this, it's going to be tough. But how do you continue to invest to make sure that that we still invest in getting new medicines, new uh, therapeutic classes, or new molecules out? How we still invest in new or the new for the for the good betterment of uh, the people? But I guess morally we need to operate in a more in a very ethically governed. Uh, so there is uh, there are also always the outliers who kind of uh, change the image of the healthcare industry. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that we lead by example. We lead what we talk and make and do right by the people we we serve. So there would be with COVID. I think there is a higher obligation of how we operate ethically while pushing the regulator. One single thing I'll tell you is the regulators have to find this issue of cracking a simple registration now that would leave open doors for very spurious drugs to come in or low quality drugs. They have to figure that out, but make mm -hmm. sure that the bottlenecks the COVID has created within the environment, be in the supply sourcing country or supply country, gets eliminated because you are then going to cause a bigger issue. So I guess that those are my, it's not two, it's three messages there. No, no, I think very nicely summed up. Um, even though I would love to carry this forward, but I know both of you have prior commitments. So we're just going to wrap it up. I think this was one of the most productive one and a half hours of my life. I learned a lot from both of you. I believe uh, so have our audiences. They were amazing messages around regulatory um, uh, policy changes to be suggested, investing in primary health care, the way um, COVID-19 has changed our perspectives about health generally, about pricing, about marketeering. Uh, I would love to have you uh, both back on the show, maybe in um, eight to 10 weeks time to see how things are going um, in, in uh, both of your countries and different regions. For now, I'm going to wrap up this show. Uh, a huge thank you for both uh, to both of you for joining in. Uh, a huge thank you to our audiences who asked us all these questions and made this show a success. And I'll see you. Um, next time in our uh, public health line uh, episode so thank you and um, bless you and a good afternoon to all thank you thank you bajia thank you kasuri uh, right right and uh, uh, thank you sorry be safe i said thank be you safe. yeah thank you and uh, very i learned a lot thank you bajia for working very hard on this uh, on this program thank you Thank you, everyone. Thank you.